fabulous to be here at this UK housing wide uh, event while I put a stop to my, what I laughingly refer to as my housing career by that introduction. Um, it is really lovely to be invited here today to chair something that's very, very close to my heart, the annual Sarah Webb uh, lecture. Um, my name is Michelle Reid. Uh, I am a recent uh, immigrant to Wales uh, and Previously to that, I worked in England for uh, TPAS, the Tenant Participation Advisory Service, or as I now refer to it, TPAS England. <laughs> <laughs> I refer to a lot of things as England, but I didn't used to refer to as England. Now I work in Wales. Uh, and... Um, it is actually fascinating uh, migrating to another country, uh, not just because of the particular changes in, in approach and attitude um, uh, across the different um, countries that make up the UK, but also because you start to realise some of the connections that you didn't take advantage of in another world. You start to realise that actually the country boundaries are only lines on a map. And um, we do have telephones that connect us. If only somebody would invent some kind of system where you could communicate with someone in one part of the, of the UK and that instantly get through to a person in another part of the UK and compare notes and spark off ideas and, and do all those kinds of connections. If someone could invent that, then it would be brilliant. <laughs> Oh no, wait, we do actually already have that. And one of the things that I'm really enjoying in my new post, as uh, I should mention where I work, don't, shouldn't I? I'm group chief executive of, uh, <laughs> yes, yes indeed, because uh, basically because we have a care and repair agency as well. But I'm <laughs> group chief executive of Cun and Taff Community Housing Group, which is a fantastic organisation, a fantastic community-based organisation working in the uh, Cunnan Valley, uh, which is an area of uh, South Wales that's um, in between uh, Brecon and Cardiff. Uh, and it's uh, an area with huge deprivation, huge health and financial inequalities, and uh, a whole range of, of fabulous people who live and work in those communities. But um, the connections that I've made in the last three, four months and the, the people that I've been able to almost put together um, has been a really, really key part of the, of the new role and I hope to continue doing that. So it's great to be here at One CIH, which is all about making connections. It's all about tying up all that strategy, all those discussions, all those boards that operate and function and, and make up the governance of, of the organisation and the, the, the monument, if you like, that is the Chartered Institute of Housing. Um, and so it's very apt, really, that this is the venue and this is the event that we hold the second annual Sarah Webb uh, lecture because those of you who knew Sarah, and there will be lots and lots of you in the audience who, who did know Sarah, um, will know that Sarah was all about connecting people. She was all about making those really important introductions and making those really key um, uh, ideas uh, percolate amongst a really varied group of people. Um, Sarah certainly took me under her wing when I kind of returned into the housing fray after having run an HIV charity for years and I didn't really know people anymore. And for some reason, after I passed the Sarah Webb test, which nobody knows what it was, but you had to pass it before um, before you uh, were, were able to join the club. So it was some kind of test around values, I've decided. Once I'd passed the five-minute Sarah um, uh, assessment, Sarah totally took me under her wing. She introduced me to people. She introduced me to 
people who she thought I would either agree with or disagree with, just really to see what would happen. <laughs> and um, it was a really, really interesting first few years when I um, started to work at TPAS England. We certainly didn't always agree, Sarah and I, um, but that was some of the fun of the relationship, actually, that I enjoyed with Sarah, was that we could disagree on things. There were certain elements of policy that we didn't agree on. There were certain elements of, you know, fashion sense and, and, and what to eat that we didn't agree on. She liked fruitcake. I think that's the spawn of Satan. But we got around it. And that is what I believe everybody found who was close to Sarah or who was lucky enough to be a colleague of Sarah's, that she found ways to agree to disagree with you and when you agreed on things then there was no finer advocate for either for your idea or for helping you to really bring that idea into reality. Um, but I think we shared the same values. I like to think we shared the same values and I think being driven by your values is core to this sector, whether we're talking about housing professionals or involved tenants, board members, partners. It's about our values and being remembering those values um, as we adapt and adopt to the changing environment that we find ourselves in. Sarah and I, and lots of others, really believed in an equal and diverse society where every voice actually matters. We both believed in social housing itself, as some people have said over the last few weeks, a force for good. Um, of course, Sarah was incredibly intelligent about the entire spectrum of housing and what that means in a way that phew, I don't understand at all, but I'm really pleased that Sarah did and that, that others who Sarah um, kind of brought along to the fore really understand that debate. Um, we both believed in the talent and the creativity of housing professionals, the creativity to come up with new solutions in the face of new challenges. And I know that's something that Gronje certainly shares and carries on um, now that Gronje is carrying the, uh, the burden slash joy slash ecstasy of leading CIH. <laughs> we, I, I hope that she would have been proud of some of the things that we've been doing this year. I hope she would have been really proud of, for example, the Shout campaign, which is aiming to really prove the case for social housing and continuing to, to develop social housing. I really hope that she would have been proud of things like the Council Homes Chat campaign slash Love Council Housing campaign that, that many of you have got behind and supported, including the Welsh Housing Minister. Just saying. <laughs> The Welsh Housing Minister who addressed the Welsh Housing Conference in a t-shirt saying this is what a feminist looks like. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> to which I tweeted, this is what a Welsh Housing Minister looks like. <laughs> and got a few retweets. Um, Sarah believed in the indisputable contribution that involved tenants make to our organisations at every level of organisations and obviously that's something that I passionately chair, uh, shared with her and something that I'm really enjoying putting my um, mouth into, uh, into action in Wales. She believed in nurturing and spotting talent and the potential of the young people in our sector, the next generation and the last few weeks I've been working with some of the finest young people in the Welsh housing sector, one of whom is sat here today, Michaela, um, and I'm really pleased that on, on one uh, article the Council Homes Chat campaign team was described as all in their 20s. I thought, yes, <laughs> get in, um, which of course we're not all, but, um, but that future being in safe hands I think would have really, really pleased Sarah, um, and she would have been uh, one of the first to really support young people uh, and the, the talent and the potential of young people in our sector. Those of you who know Sarah know that she was a great communicator, 
regardless of her audience, whether she was giving a barnstorming performance and taking whatever new housing minister we had to task, whatever colour the rosette was on the lapel of that housing minister, she, um, she certainly didn't allow people to go away with the impression that the housing sector didn't care about new policies, had no opinion to offer on new policies or weren't prepared to work with some policies but ask for other uh, bargains in return. So she was she was really good communicator on that level. I saw her and invited her to come to TPAS conferences where she would equally receive huge applause from very discerning uh, tenant audiences. Uh, the last time I actually saw Sarah was when she spoke. Uh, she was very ill, but she was determined to come and speak at the TPAS uh, annual conference. And despite some of the battles that she had at that point in her life and on her journey, she was amazing that day on the Question Time uh, panel, and she got a rousing round of applause um, from the tenants there. Sarah used her experience of working on the ground to inform her policy and practice. I was desperately trying to remember the surname of, uh, of the Mrs McGinty. Is it Mrs McGinty? She would always talk about Mrs McGinty and apply any sort of social housing policy to what Mrs McGinty would think. And I think that that, again, demonstrates how values driven she was. So, as I said, we could, we could always disagree, but the debate was always worth having with Sarah. Um, and she has brought along a fine new generation of people who are now leading uh, and taking the CIH um, banner forward, if I can use that word. Um, so the annual Sarah Webb lecture was, was devised by a group of friends and colleagues of Sarah um, shortly after she died. Uh, Gronje in particular was, was keen on not setting up an award or not you know, setting up a bursary. So one of the things we wanted to really do was to really try to carry on and continue and make Sarah's values continue to live and have life and spark debate on an ongoing basis. And so the annual or biannual Sarah Webb lecture to be decided is, is what came from that group of people who, who really tried to think about what Sarah might like. So, so we want to spark some debate. And um, that brings me to our fabulous, quite fabulous uh, guest speaker tonight. This is the second Sarah Webb lecture. It's a tough gig to get invited to. And uh, I'm absolutely delighted that that, uh, that honour has gone to, um, to the fabulous Kate Davies, who is the, many of you will know, is the, um, is the chief executive of Notting Hill Housing. Group chief, is it? Group. <laughs> Uh, but we don't care about labels here. Um, uh, Kate is the uh, group chief executive of, of Notting Hill Housing, who are doing amazing things on the ground um, and in partnership with, with tenants and staff to kind of drive forward um, a whole range of issues. She also, though, is a, perhaps a little-known fact that um, Kate also makes all of her own clothes and has an interesting byline in fashion blogs and uh, is actually sporting some of her creations tonight. So, no pressure, Kate, but obviously if tonight does go badly, it is good to have a second string to your bow just to fall back on. I, I've always found that anyway. My <laughs> cycling proficiency test will come in very well after tonight. So... Kate is going to make us think, and I realise that we are between you and your dinner, um, but Kate's going to make us, going to throw out some thoughts, going to spark some debate, and then we'd like to hear from you uh, about what you think about some of the things that, that, that Kate is talking about. Uh, and then I'm just going to come back with some closing remarks while the starters are burning, and uh, we will have a fabulous night of debate. Can I just ask you, when you do start to ask questions, if you could kind of frame your 12-minute rants to at least try to um, create a question at the end of them, <laughs> that would be fabulous. So without further ado, would you please give an extremely warm one CIH welcome to the fabulous, dynamic Kate Davies.
lecture. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was really spiffy. And I uh, really enjoy hearing from a woman with a great sense of humour and a great sense of timing. It's really hard to do, and I really, you know, really rate people who can make us laugh, so well done. Um, for me, it is a huge honour to be asked to do this Sarah Webb Memorial Lecture t tonight, and I'm basically going to use some notes, which I don't usually do, because I the weight and seriousness of what I'm doing is sort of pressing down on me. And the subject I have chosen, really, in consultation with Gronje and Liza, is the question of the demonization of social tenants, which is the topic of the day, I feel, and so obviously summed up by programs like How to Get a Council House and Benefit Street. Now, I'm sure you all appreciate that these programs are mainly commissioned and edited uh, for entertainment value. Uh, the real people who feature in them are, after all, caricatures. Um, but many of us who work in housing have reacted with some degree of <coughs> anger to these caricatures and these negative portrayals of the customers that we serve. When our customers are marginalized and misrepresented, we feel it too. Um, and underlying our concern is the fact that we worry that public opinion, as it exists, appears to support the cuts that are taking place to benefits, the sanctions on poor and disabled people, and a negative attitude to black people and immigrants. And uh, some research by Mori, Ipso Mori recently uh, makes the point really forcefully that by a margin of two and a half to one, the British public said that the benefit system is too generous. 85% of people in this country believe there are groups of people who claim benefits who should have their benefits cut. So the general thinking and opinion in this country is pretty negative about people who are receiving benefits and people who benefit in the form of social housing. So in a sense, we are really up against it in terms of the way that most people think. So in response to this, there's been a very well-orchestrated We Love Council Housing campaign mentioned by Michelle, and I'd like to salute her and other people who've worked with her, Michaela and others, uh, with, with her sterling efforts. And I do count myself as a supporter, and I joined in, like many of you, and I was proud to do that. But tonight I'd like to offer something of a critique of that approach. So many of the efforts to date have consisted of rather mature and well-paid successful housing professionals announcing that they were born and brought up in council housing. And we've been treated to some very touching photographs, often in black and white, um, of tidy front lawns, smiling babies in silver cross prams, ladies with crisp cotton skirts on them. Uh, a golden age, really, where we all played out in the sunshine and enjoyed chatting to our neighbours. The problem, as I see it myself, and I have to declare an interest, I was not born in council housing, but I have sort of three problems with this approach. The first is that many of the advocates did not remain in social housing. Secondly, that social housing is very different today than how it was in the 1950s and 60s. And thirdly, I believe this is an approach which glosses over some of the very real problems we have in managing social housing today. So let me take those three points and perhaps tell you what, what, uh, what lies behind these opinions. First, I thought I'd take as an example my husband's family, who were born and brought up in council housing in the east end of London, in some pretty appalling council housing as it happens, and that housing was knocked down and his family was sent to Hollow Newtown. And I know there's a lot of people in from Essex tonight, and they'll know <laughs> what a great place Hollow Newtown was. Actually, a really nice place. And I've been on a pilgrimage to that little house, that semi-detached where he was moved to with his family, and they had a nice garden, new schools, brand new skills, fresh air, lots of friends. and. Uh, as soon as they could, his mum and dad bought a little house in Croydon and moved away from that idyllic uh, garden city of Harlow. Um, and they stayed in that house um, in Croydon until they died. And their view was that 
the move to owner occupation was, in a sense, uh, a move up, uh, control over, over their housing, um, and um, that a mortgage was a better investment than rent. So that's the first point. All the people who, who think social housing is great, probably most of them are no longer living in it. Secondly, council housing has changed, and I think this is something all of us can agree on. When we see those lovely photographs, I don't know if you follow the blog Municipal Housing, but it's a very interesting blog that shows the, the dynamism and the vision of the people putting the social housing up when it started, and then you compare it to how it is today, and it really is quite a different place. So it's not just the decline uh, and degradation of the fabric of social housing, but also the question of allocation of social housing. Certainly when I managed social housing in Brighton, I was the director of housing in Brighton and Hove, um, when I went to, say, like the Moolscombe estate, which today is regarded as a not very attractive estate, initially when it was built, it was only used by the much better off people. You had to be on a good wage. It was the, like for the labor aristocracy when it was first designed. It was not for unemployed people at all. The poorest of the poor lived in rooms in the private rented sector. And so the way that social housing has been allocated has changed a lot. And John Hill's, Professor Hill's seminal report indicated that since the 1970s, there'd been a very steady decline in the proportion of better off people living in social housing. The richest third of, of uh, uh, inhabitants, if you like, had almost entirely left social housing by 2004. And uh, another piece of work by the Smith Institute, that's John Smith, not Adam Smith, um, in 2008, they found that, quote, social housing was until the mid-60s the tenure of choice for many. The depressing conclusion of a big piece of work they did, the depressing conclusion is that social housing has become an indicator of risk for adult life chances above and beyond what might be expected as well as poorer households being increasingly concentrated in social housing, social housing has become more concentrated in deprived areas. So that, that change in, in who was living there became very marked. I remember when I was in Brighton sitting around a, a, a meeting with my senior team, and we worked out half of us had been born and brought up in social housing. And we reflected that, like the locally sourced football team, this was going out of fashion. Apparently, the people going to Brazil, I read tonight, you know, there's, there's hardly a, a British person amongst them. But I mean, in the old days, my, my mother went out with the black, black, a berry footballer who used to walk to his games. You know, they were all local people. But council housing was the same. You know, you lived in the area, you lived in social housing, and then you went to work for the council. It was very much a, a, a way of life, really, for quite a few people, but it has really gone out of fashion. And last year, there were 1.7 million people registered on local authority waiting lists in the UK, but only 12% of them were allocated a home. So we're only meeting the need of the top, say, 10%, the most needy, or the bottom 10%, if you like, of the people who would like and need social housing. We're only meeting a very small proportion of that. And then the third argument I have here, and I, this is sort of my main beef, but I don't think you can deal with crude propaganda with crude propaganda, saying, and I'm going to sing now, this is very difficult. <coughs> you say it's disreputable, we say it's delectable, you say it's dirty, and we say it's pretty, nicey, nasty, hate it, love it, let's call the whole thing off. <laughs> okay, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not much of a singer, but I was just trying to show, you can't fight the BBC or whoever it is by just saying it's the opposite of what they say. I'm arguing for a more nuanced conversation with the public about social housing. Uh, I don't think the crude dichotomies really help anybody. So let's talk about the new realities. What is social housing really like today? I'm sure everyone in the CIH would wish to bust those myths. We're all offended by the mythical social tenant, that beer-drinking man with <coughs> tattoos and a vest, a smoking, swearing woman with lots of children, 
unemployed ignorant people parodied by Harry Enfield's Wayne and Waynetta and Little Britain's Vicky Pollard. These TV themes are backed up by the populist press and often supported passively by the public. So, while I think we must accept that allocation policies have increased the number of socially disadvantaged tenants and that the inhuman design and poor maintenance of many big estates have added to the problem, we, as the housing profession, have a very important role. Everyone here will know that social housing tenants are a diverse and varied group, the only thing that unites them is that someone in authority once decided that they were in need of social housing, otherwise they're as varied as we are or the people in the next room are. It's my experience in London that the, most of the new lettings are going to very disadvantaged households and uh, the fact remains, if we look at the statistics, that 70% of all new lettings of tenants moving into social housing were not in work. 70% were not in work. So it really is the case that the fact is, even though we might portray ourselves as being typical social housing tenants, clearly by the fact we have a job, we're not typical of the social housing tenants. And I just wondered if you thought about those who live in, in your stock, the, the tenants who, who are uh, residents in your association or council, how would you think about them? How would you divide them up? And I did a little bit of research at Notting Hill. Crudely, we can divide our tenant group into two groups. Probably seven out of ten are what you might call a successful working family who are more or less self-sufficient. They require financial support, often through tax credits or housing benefit, because the gap between their salary and the cost of our cheapish housing is too great for them to meet that out of their own resources. They may be working part-time, they may be in a badly paid job, but they are going to need some financial help. Uh, but they are self-sufficient, they don't need any other, any sort of other kind of looking after. And the other group, which would be three out of 10, 30% of tenants, are really vulnerable in some way and require some support. And those people will tend to get support from social services or health or the voluntary sector or from us as the landlord. And I believe a significant number of the people who we evict every year or we have a particular problem with to do with ASB or rent arrears are actually from this vulnerable group. They're not really able to manage their money without help. They're not really able to manage their behavior without help. And these are people who we end up evicting because we cannot, within social housing, manage their behaviour in a, in a sufficient way. Um, and at Notting Hill we, we evict 80 households a year, which is less than half a percent, 70 of them for rent arrears and less than 10 for antisocial behaviour. And we only evict when we've tried absolutely everything else that we can do to prevent them from becoming homeless. But their problems are just too great to be contained within social housing. And then there's a, a really small group, uh, and I don't know the exact number, uh, of people who are actually dishonest, who have lied to get their social housing, or who are subletting it illegally, or who are pretending to be disabled when they're not, or they're defrauding housing benefit. Undoubtedly, in social housing, as in all other types of housing, there is a criminal group as well. And in popular consciousness, this second group, the vulnerable, and the third group, the small group, who are criminal, are sort of lumped together. The problem people, the, the, the difficult people. Um, and the aspirant and well-organized tenants are ignored because they're not any trouble. And I think it's the same as the recent coverage we've experienced around food banks. Um, and it's obvious to us who work with poorer people every day that many people are experiencing genuine hardship at the moment. And gifts of food and money really can help. Uh, but there are always a few people who are going to abuse any system and it's quite easy to prove that if you want. So let's go back to those ghastly television programs. Although people who've watched them have told me that there is something in them, you know, some, some elements of how difficult it is to help people and, and so on. Uh, but I like to do nice stuff in my free time, like make clothes rather than watch <laughs> rubbish television. But I think it is worth exploring just briefly how stereotypes work. 
I mean, I think if there was a programme made about fox hunting, uh, the cameras would in ever invariably focus on the dimmest, poshest rider. It, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be much fun if they didn't, you know. They have to get this guy, they look for him, right? Oh, he's the, he's the nutter, we'll focus on him. And then he might say some sensible things, but those go on the cutting room, room floor. When he says something sensational, that's when they, they cut that out. And the point is, really, that this is the nature of the media, as I say, designed to entertain rather than inform. And I guess that's why our reaction to it matters. There is a desire by Michelle, Michaela, and Mirtha to prove that all these tenants are actually really nice, successful people like they are, uh, and the boorish people on the television are just made up. But I don't think the media alone are responsible for people's prejudices. These are real people, they're not actors. Bad tenants exist. And some of the people we house really do have a stack of problems. And while there are also some completely beautiful, desirable estates, we must accept that some of our stock is run down, unattractive, dirty, and unloved. And I'm sure you, even you have walked through a council estate sometimes and just felt a little bit uneasy. It has an edgy feel to it. Even though you know what it is and who lives there, there is sometimes a feeling that you get that this is really a place that has some danger in it. And many people who live in social housing and council housing today will complain that they've experienced neglect, poor quality design, uh, a failure of repairs, vandalism, litter, graffiti, in addition to antisocial behaviour from time to time. And is something deeper happening here, perhaps? There is a psychological uh, truth that a number of us, all of us, survive to a certain extent by projecting the bad parts of ourselves and our fears onto others um, so that uh, people who we feel are doing us out of something or perhaps seen as a threat to us, I think myself, this is a, a, a useful way to understand things like racism, xenophobia, sexism, anti-Semitism and homophobia, that we label other people as being something other than we are, and then we put bad stuff onto them, and it enables us to feel better about ourselves. And these stereotypes block our ability to think about others as ordinary people, as individuals. The label council tenant, which is put on someone, becomes a boundary that allows us to define ourselves as not like them, um, and, as I say, project our frustrations onto them. And it's obviously folly to say that all council tenants are the same, or all Somalis, or indeed all menopausal women are all the same. Uh, of course they're not. But scapegoating is when we also put negative connotations on that. So the council housing tenants are scroungers, the Somalis are violent, and the menopausal women are dotty, obviously. So, in the case of social housing, it's even worse because much of it is built on big estates and it therefore concentrates the specific group of council tenant in a geographic area that's often out of sight and out of mind. And as I mentioned, really, I have friends who've never been on a council estate. You wouldn't go on one if you didn't live there or work there. And they'd probably be afraid to as well. And that's because of this scapegoating and stereotyping that's going on. And of course, the only thing that really undermines stereotypes is in fact meeting people as individuals and having a relationship with them. Then you realize that no one is perfect and <coughs> nobody is irretrievably bad. Everybody has a mixture of good and bad in them whether they're a council tenant or not. And as meeting them as individuals, we realize that this sort of crude labeling really is insufficient and doesn't work. And this really is the key point of what I'm saying tonight. Who meets social tenants as individuals and builds a long-term relationship with them? Why? It's us. We're the people who do that. We know the truth. That social tenants are just normal people, just like everybody else, and not essentially different from people who live in other tenures. A large proportion have reasons for qualifying for social housing, which can be as simple as poverty and can be as complex as having multiple needs. 
uh, I can think of one, of one of our tenants who's a single parent, she's also learning disabled, mentally ill, obese, has experience of domestic violence and homelessness, and is addicted to Valium. And this person could become a figure of hatred, but for most of us, she's just another tenant, and we do our very best to help. And this, I think, is what makes our profession so damn impressive. We aren't judgmental. We treat everyone as an individual. If the tenant's an eccentric old transvestite with cancer, or a Bengali family with a violent excluded teenager, we actually embrace them and their problems, and we try to help them. We really do care about our tenants, and we don't label them or disrespect them or condemn them. They're just people like you and me. And despite the advent of call centers and internet-based services, housing is not a transactional business. Our tenants are usually with us for life, and it pays us to get to know each other. And blaming people for their difficulties doesn't do anything to help anyone. And I'm not romanticizing here about people who damage others. I know that serious ASV really can ruin communities. And we have to deal with this and illegal behavior, rudeness, dishonesty, and aggression. Where we can, we try to help people become better parents and better neighbors, to be more reliable and to be more productive. And our ability to do this day in, day out, helping people who have a fairly difficult time is, I think, what makes the job rewarding. I had lunch yesterday with a young woman at Notting Hill who became an apprentice of ours four years ago in the finance team. Uh, she's a 26-year-old mixed-race mother of one, and she's just completed the first part of her accountancy exams. And in conversation, she told me that she's also a tenant of Notting Hill, which I didn't know. And that made me extra happy because we'd first provided her with safe, affordable home, then an opportunity to have some training, then an opportunity to have a work, get a job, and to become a, a professional, an accountant. And I just feel we should be thrilled to bits and celebrate those kind of achievements when they happen. But by the same token, we've also got to accept, I think, that many of our tenants are so damaged by their upbringing, their experiences, their breakdowns, their poverty, their experience of war or discrimination or their addictions, that they cannot just be pushed into work encouraged into work as the government might believe or the self-sufficiency that we wish for, for, our, for everybody. Some will get there eventually and many will not and for me this is the real value of social housing. Not that it houses lovely people with nice jobs in social housing but actually that we house the most vulnerable. People who cannot work, people who cannot look after themselves. That a house, a home almost on its own is sufficient to contain them and their problems. And our caring role really means that those sort of people have somewhere safe to live, a landlord who won't turn a blind eye or blame them for the misfortunes that they've experienced. We provide a safe haven for vulnerable people that means that they will be okay. So we do our jobs professionally, and is there anything else we can do? And we feel we ought to be doing more than that, making sure that the estates we manage are as clean and well managed and as modern and well looked after as possible and the people who live in them are as cared for and looked after and, and uh, provided for as much as possible. That's our job. Is there anything else we could do, particularly to deal with this stigma question? One, use the media better perhaps. Michelle and others uh, put, are putting these positive stories together and the redemption tales are fantastic. Nostalgia has a role. We have a 50, 50th anniversary site at Notting Hill. But I think we need to put more emphasis on keeping these fragile people safe. I think it's a great story. I don't think we, we should pretend we don't, you know, everybody in social housing is lovely. A lot of people have problems and we, ne we need to feature their stories too. And I think it would be totally wonderful if every social landlord could honestly explain the work that they do and use the means they have, their websites, local articles and social media. There's a campaign called Real London Lives just about to kick off, organized by G15, where we've produced video evidence of what our tenants' lives are like. Um, and I think this will help us to explain to the public who we're housing, what their lives are like, what their advantages and challenges might be. So I think we need to show more about how we house, house needier people as well as the aspirant poor. 
next bit of advice is to stop talking to ourselves. I know this is true, I hate to say it, but we're really, really good at talking to ourselves. Uh, can we think of ways of getting our message out more broadly? I was invited by a local residents association where I live to go and talk about social housing. None of them lived in social housing. Some of the questions they asked would make you blush, pretty bad. But I do think uh, I was able to bust some myths, talk to them about what really happens, why it exists, and have a calm, reasonable, factual discussion. And I do believe I changed some minds, and I do think that's a worthwhile thing to do, to take up those invitations to speak uh, to other people and talk to, to your friends who don't work in social <coughs> housing. And uh, finally, I think I would like to suggest that our profession should speak more. As professionals, nobody knows better than we, CIH members and housing professionals. We need constantly to enunciate the case for social housing in many ways, in many forums, using real examples from our contemporary practice. What do you actually do? What have you been doing? Um, not a mythical golden age of council housing, but what we are actually doing. Some of the issues around crack houses, about guns on estates, about domestic violence and so on. These are not nicey, nicey subjects. These are difficult subjects and we play a very important role for society in doing that. And I would love to find a way to get some of our frontline staff to work with our customers to tell these stories, uh, not from the top, the top levels, but I know that John Popham has been doing some videos with smartphones. We have the technology to do, uh, to film people at home to talk about what a difference their housing has made. And here, I agree completely with Michelle, Michaela, and of course, with Sarah herself. Let's change the story. Thank you. Just to finish off uh, very quickly, because the, the starters are out of the oven now. Um, this is a memorial, almost, to Sarah. This is a living, breathing memorial and what we think encapsulates the best kind of ideas. Last week I attended another memorial service for another fantastic um, housing um, great, Richard Crossley, who, again, like Sarah, had done amazing things in his life. And just as I learnt lots and lots of things about Richard last week that I didn't know, I only knew the bits that I knew about Richard, um, when I went to Sarah's uh, memorial service with lots of people who were in the room, okay. Karen and Gonya and others who were there. Um, I learned lots and lots about Sarah and the amazing things that she did. And one of the things that came through very, very clearly again at Sarah's memorial service was around her values. And something that was read out at Sarah's service really has stuck with me ever since that day. I think you know what I'm about to do. Um, and it's something that I keep now on whatever desk I work on. And I just want to share it with you to go into your evening and second day of um, what I hope is a very values-led uh, meeting um, today. And it's called Mediations from a Simple Path. You might know it as the always poem that, uh, that, that Mother Teresa wrote. And it's an extract from that. And it says, people are unreasonable illogical and self-centred. Love them anyway. If you do good, people may accuse you of selfish motives. Do good anyway. If you're successful, you may win false friends and true enemies. Succeed anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Honesty and transparency make you vulnerable. Be honest and transparent anyway. What you spend years building might be destroyed overnight. Build anyway. People who really want help may attack you if you help them. Help them anyway. Give the world the best you have and you may get hurt. But give the world your best anyway. And I hope that we can all take something from that and carry forward with our amazing values that CIH certainly uh, engender in the profession and good luck with tomorrow and the uh, last day of your meeting. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.